Martyrs and Missionaries is a production of Revive Studios. You're listening to Martyrs and Missionaries. I'm Elise, and in every episode, I'll bring you a new martyr and or missionary, the called and the brave. In this episode, we're talking about Christian and Missionary Alliance missionary, Robert Jaffrey. So usually at the top of the episode in the introduction, I announce where they were a missionary to, what their name is, um, even sometimes what period they served during, if it's particularly noteworthy. But I didn't do that for Robert Jaffrey because he actually served in many different areas, predominantly in China, but then also in Vietnam and then in uh, what is now Indonesia. At that point, it was called the Dutch East Indies. So instead of saying all that in the intro, I figured I'd save it for now. Before we get into this episode, I want to share a quote with you by A.W. Tozer, who actually wrote the biography for Robert Jaffrey. He says, Next to the Holy Scriptures, the greatest aid to the life of faith may be Christian biography. I get many different emails asking me, have you read this biography yet? You should check this person out, read this person's biography. Uh, And so I know that you guys feel the same way. And that's why I wanted to share that quote with you before we begin, because it is so fundamental for encouragement in the life of a believer to hear about other people who lived these incredibly amazing and faithful lives. It's good for the soul. And I would say it's better than chicken soup for the soul. Robert Jaffrey was born December 16, 1873, in Toronto, Canada. And before we begin talking about him, we probably should talk about his dad, because I feel like a lot of the things that uh, made Robert Jaffrey who he was were partially due to who his dad was and what kind of guy that his dad was. His dad is also called Robert Jaffrey, so I'm not going to really mention names because that would just be really confusing. Um, So his dad was born in Scotland, and he's one of many children. He immigrated to Canada at the age of 20 in 1852. And then soon he becomes the co-owner of a grocery store. He marries late. He has five kids. And then a fire just takes it all away just overnight. And he's $10,000 in debt. That's $10,000 in the 1800s, which is quite a lot of money. So he has a few hard years, but he diversified his business endeavors. He gets into real estate, lumber, insurance, and then eventually he's able to buy the Toronto Globe newspaper. But then... He loses it all again. So he has everything taken from him except for the paper. And he struggles back up, and he's well past middle age when you're thinking, I'm set, I'm secure, I don't have to worry about anything like that anymore. But he has to scrape again, and he ends up paying off his debts. He becomes a senator, and then he dies at the age of 82 with a considerable inheritance left to all of his five children. And this inheritance will serve his son very well later on in life when he's doing a lot of missionary work that requires a lot of funding, especially when you're um, trying to build things during the Great Depression. So as we go through Robert's story, knowing that his father was the way that he was, it's not going to be super surprising that his son had much of that same tenacity. But in contrast, Robert uh, was born with diabetes and he also has heart disease. So he's obese as a child. Um, He's not able to do the things that he would like to do. As other children are doing sports, he has to sit on the sidelines. Um, He can't walk very far. He gets very easily winded. So he's not a healthy guy. But we've done enough of these episodes to know we've looked at enough lives to know that that does not stop God from using you. In fact, I'm beginning to form a life philosophy um, that that's the catalyst for God using you. The more you look like and feel like maybe roadkill, the more than the Lord ends up using you. Maybe that's a bit too uh, stark, but it, I think it's true that some of the people who do the coolest things um, in some of the harshest conditions are also some of the sickliest people um, that you've ever met. That's not always true, but it's true, I would say, 75% of the time. Anyway, his mother takes the kids to church. His father really isn't into church. He doesn't Um, forbid the kids from going, but it's not really his thing. And in fact, for a while, he actually is going to these atheist meetings with all these influential people in Toronto. But he also says that's not for him because he just has too much respect for the idea of God. It's a really interesting thing. As far as I can tell, his father never becomes uh, a believer. Um, But his mother was very faithful. 
They went to a church called St. James Presbyterian Church. And at the time, it was being pastored by a guy called Samuel H. Kellogg, whom I'd never heard of before reading Tozer's book, so I had to look into him a little bit. He's actually a really, really interesting man. So he pastors this church for only six years, but he was a missionary to India, and he revised the Hindi Bible translation, and he wrote a treatise on Hindi grammar. He actually turned the tide of American evangelicalism from an eschatology of postmillennialism to an eschatology of premillennialism. And Jaffrey becomes a believer at the age of 16 under Kellogg's ministry. Four years later, he has the opportunity to hear A.B. Simpson speak. A.B. Simpson is the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance. And after he hears Simpson speak, he wants to be a missionary. He wants to go to Simpson's school in New York. He has a mission school there. Um, He's still working as an insurance clerk, kind of under one of the businesses of his father. And he tells his father, hey, I'm going to be a missionary and I would like your blessing because I need some money to be able to do it. And his father flat out refuses. He says, no way, you're not getting a dime from me. If you want to go into the pastorate, fine, by all means, go do that. But I'm not sending you off to be a missionary. I'm not going to send you off to go uh, waste your life on some mission field out there somewhere. But Jaffrey is determined, he goes anyway, and he pays his own way. And in 1897, at almost 24, so about four years later, he and a small ship head out for China to the Guangxi province in southern China, which borders Vietnam. They're there studying language when he meets a lady named Minnie Donor, who had been there for three years already. She had become a Christian at the age of 17, and she goes to the same mission training school, Simpsons Training School, and her ministry was to the sex trafficking victims uh, that were in the brothels, especially along the riverfronts. Jeffrey and Minnie get married in 1900, and they have their only child, Margaret, seven years later. When Jaffrey first gets to China, there's nothing noteworthy about his ministry at first. Um, He's just kind of listed, as Tozer says, he's just kind of listed on a roll there. Like they have, um, oh, here's all the missionaries that are serving in this part of China. And he's just a name. And at some point, and I don't really know exactly when this happened, but he becomes more of a field commander. And part of the way that he worked, because he had all of his health issues with his heart disease and the diabetes, um, he had to work in bed. So he had this table that he would set up over his bed and he had all of his papers and all of his maps and all the different things he needed to do for the day kind of set up for him. And he would oversee missionary operations that way. And by this point, he'd already moved to Wuzhou, which is in southern China still, so not a super far move, but he would oversee operations from there for the next 35 years. Jaffrey was very particular about his methodology, what worked on the ground uh, versus what the home office said, and that got him into trouble sometimes. But his thoughts were, I don't want to come to China and make Western Christians. I want to make Chinese Christians. I want people to be able to still be and feel Chinese while they are believers and not have to feel as though they had to fit into some kind of um, Western mold in order to practice uh, Christianity and be a faithful uh, believer in Christ. So his system was very straightforward. Um, he would come into an area, or other missionaries would come into an area. They would uh, evangelize. Some people would become believers. Uh, they would baptize them and then immediately start a church. And then they would get a Bible school so they could disciple these believers. And then they would get mission houses. So they'd kind of work out that way. And one of the other things he wanted is for these churches to be independent from foreign missionaries. And this was not something that the other mission boards wanted and something that the other missionaries also did didn't want. Um, So there had to be a compromise that was worked out. Um, So the compromise was this. There would be three committees, one that was entirely Chinese missionaries, one that was entirely foreign missionaries, and one that was comprised of equal numbers of each. So it's a little bit cumbersome, but it was relatively effective. Another one of his methods that got him into trouble was how he ran meetings. Um, For example, if there was the funding of an orphanage on the docket, are we going to continue to fund this orphanage or are we not? He would say, all in favor of throwing these children on the streets, raise your hand. And nobody wanted to say they were in favor of throwing children on the streets, so they would agree to fund the orphanage. But this would cause some problems um, because people didn't like feeling pushed into a corner that way. But the people on his team, they loved him. They knew he meant well. And that's very evident in the way that they spoke about him, as we'll see a little bit later on. One of the other huge things he did that was actually revolutionary was create a printing press um, for materials that would be sent out 
um, to these uh, missionaries, uh, both native and foreign, that were serving out in these really remote areas. And it actually ended up circulating throughout the whole world. Um, and it was just these lectures and sermons and and different discipleship tidbits because he knew that while the missionaries were there on the field, it was difficult for them to uh, feel poured into. And some of these missionaries, uh, especially the ones that were maybe a little bit newer in the faith, they needed a little bit more discipleship than maybe they had been able to receive before going out to the field. And he had a gift for it because, as I said, his father ran the Toronto Globe. So he grew up around printing presses, around newspapers, around all these things. He knew how it worked, and he did it really, really well. His printing press sent out scriptures, articles, uh, hymns, and it was a great encouragement to the missionaries serving in those far-off places and also to Christians who were just sitting at home. In 1898, so about a year after he got there, he decides to take a trip into Vietnam. At this point, it's called Indochina, and he ends up becoming the field director um, for there. He's the field director for China. Now he's the field director for Indochina. He also made a survey trip into Cambodia, but it doesn't look like that really went anywhere. But ministry in Vietnam was going really well until the outbreak of World War I. Moving ahead a few years to 1925, it's the middle of the Chinese Civil War, and the missionaries are sent to Hong Kong for their safety. A small group of missionaries decided that they weren't doing anything anyway, and they wanted to sign on to a ship, uh, which was having trouble getting uh, crew members to be able to sail it to deliver some goods. This ship was going to be stopping in America, and they thought, well, if we sign on to the ship, then we can go visit our families for a while, then we'll come back, no big deal. So that's what they did. They go to America, they visit their families, they come back. Jaffrey hears about it. He is absolutely furious with them. All but two of them, he immediately fired and sent them home. Um, he ran a very tight ship. There was a very strict uh, guideline on what was expected for his missionaries, and this went way out of line for them. So uh, Jaffrey himself, he wasn't always a rule follower, as we kind of saw earlier. He would do his own thing, but it was always in the interest of advancing the gospel. And this was the exact opposite of that, where it was, I just want to go home and visit my family for a while, and then I'll come back. And um, he did not like that at all. When he'd been in China for 35 years, so he's 55 years old, he was asked to become the vice president back at the home office in the U.S. And he politely declined. He said he didn't want to be chained to a desk stateside. He had had a profitable and flourishing ministry in China, but he was looking ahead to the other areas. Things are going really well in China, and he decides in 1927 to check out the Dutch East Indies, or what is now today Indonesia. Since 1815, the Dutch had ruled the vast majority of Indonesia. Uh, before this, it was divided into conglomerations of individual kingdoms, city-states, etc., and they had been Muslim since the 13th century, Due to the arrival of Arab Muslim merchants that were coming from the Arabian Peninsula via the Maritime Silk Road. The Portuguese had come as early as the 16th century looking for spices because the spice must flow. They were mainly concentrated in Maluku and Portuguese Malacca. There were some missionary efforts on the part of the Catholic Church. These had varying degrees of success, uh, but there was one story in particular that stood out to me, and that is the story of Southern Sulawesi. Sulawesi is a big island that is located northeast of Java, and they had asked for missionaries to come in and teach them about Christianity, but the Portuguese decided that it wasn't profitable because there weren't any spices in that region. So instead, this group converts to Islam when a group of Islamic missionaries come to them a few years later. And this reminded me of the story of, well, actually two different stories, the story of MacArthur who after World War II, he had asked for a bunch of Bibles and missionaries to be sent to Japan because he realized that the people needed something. They were so broken that he saw it. He thought they need to hear the hope of Christ. And America decided not to send anybody to them. And, and the same thing even happened with Genghis Khan. He sent a letter asking a Catholic church to send missionaries because he wanted to hear more about Christianity. And the basically nobody wanted to go. So they didn't send anybody, and Genghis Khan was very insulted and decided to invite some Islamic uh, missionaries to talk to his people, and they ended up all converting to Islam. So these are all rather sad stories.
While Jaffrey is in the Dutch East Indies, he visits Bali, Kalimantan, which is directly north of Java, Sulawesi. I don't believe he actually goes to Java, but he sees so many people who have never heard of Christ and his heart is burdened. And when he gets back to China, he immediately writes a letter to the board asking for permission to send a team and resources to get started. The board writes him back, no, there's not an interest of the board to do that. There's not the finances to do that because they're in the middle of the Great Depression. And he decides, well, okay, like it seems like that's my answer. Not going to worry about it. I'll just keep on doing my ministry here. And then he has this dream. He says, it was a horrible dream. I thought I was at home. I thought I was a fugitive fleeing from justice with stains of human blood on my hands. I thought the Lord Jesus was pursuing me. I was filled with fear and running for my life. The pure white snow was on the ground. I stopped and tried to wash the blood stains from my hand in the snow. I looked around and ran again. I awoke, and my first words were, Oh, Lord Jesus, what does it mean? I'm not running away from you. I have no blood stains on my hands. I'm washed clean in your precious blood. Oh, teach me what this means. And at once this scripture came to my mind. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them the warning from me. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. And immediately he thought of the Dutch East Indies. If I don't warn them, if I preach not the gospel to them, I will be accountable for their blood. So he writes a letter to the board, and he says, hey, I know you guys aren't okay with this, but I'm going to head out, and the Lord will provide. And his idea is to bring a group of Chinese missionaries um, and then also to get the backing of wealthy Chinese. So he gets the Chinese missionaries, notably Leland Wong, who used to be part of the missionary circle of uh, Watchman Nee. They ended up having some kind of falling out, which I'm not sure exactly what happened there, uh, but they never reconciled. But Leland became a traveling evangelist and gained the nickname of the Moody of China. So he goes into these areas and he starts breaking the ground. And then another missionary named Pastor Chu worked for many years in Makassar, which is in eastern Sulawesi. And these Chinese missionaries at first were working with the Chinese along the coast. But by 1941, they felt that their calling was no longer to the coast, but to a group of people called the Dayaks. The Dayaks were notorious headhunters. They had a fearsome reputation among basically everybody in the world knew who these guys were. And due to the ministry of these missionaries, almost a thousand Dayaks became believers. And 10 years before this, there were 13 foreign missionaries on the new field, along with numerous Chinese co-workers working in eight different mission stations. At the highest, there were 30 foreign workers, 20 Chinese workers, and 140 local evangelists. And this is in spite of the limited money that was able to be sent from Canada and America because of the Great Depression. So it goes to show you that no matter what's going on in the world, you can have a global, um, a global depression. But if God wants something done somewhere, he makes it happen, which is always an encouraging reminder. In 1931, the Jaffrey family left their home in Wujo after almost 40 years of ministry. And they moved to Makassar. And his daughter, Margaret, had been away for four years training at the Missionary College in New York, and then she did some ministry in Kentucky. And when she returned to Indonesia, she said, Four years have passed, and what are my impressions as I return to Makassar? How wonderful the Lord has developed the work here at headquarters in this short time. Then there was no Bible school. Now there are over 70 students who assemble daily to study the Word of God. Four years ago, seven missionaries composed the staff of foreign workers. Now we are 17. Then we had no converts in the city, and during these years, over a hundred have been saved and baptized. Now, as for Jaffrey, he's retirement age, he's got a lot of health conditions, maybe he might be slowing it down a little bit, right? But no, he doubles down. He says, during these days alone here, I have made it an almost invariable rule to retire early, and then to rise early in the morning at 4.30 or 5 o'clock, and give three hours of the best part of the day to the word and prayer. I'm having a wonderful time in the book of Revelation. Thus, after three hours before breakfast in the word of God and waiting on him, I am ready for the 101 duties of the day. It was also during these early morning hours when Jaffrey often composed many of the articles for his Bible magazine, which is the one that would circulate around the world. 
In 1935, he arranged for his printing press in Wuzhou to be sent over to Makassar so they would be able to start printing much-needed resources. But there was a mysterious fire in the warehouse where it was uh, placed, and it was destroyed and unable to be brought over. But thankfully, due to his personal funds and donations, he was able to get a new one. By 1941, 209 local believers studied in the Makassar Bible Institute, and 74 Sunday schools, reaching 32,000 students, were organized. The church was also nearly financially self-supporting. Jaffrey tried to venture into Malaysia, but he was shut down by his organization. The head at the time, William Smalley, said, Dr. Jaffrey's keen desire to have a part in every effort of getting the gospel to all men everywhere may have caused him to close his eyes to what some thought were serious errors in judgment and administration. So he ends up using his own money to try to start the evangelism in uh, Malaysia. He tries to get a Bible institute going But shortly after it started, the Japanese invade. World War is looming, and Jaffrey is on furlough in Canada, and people are telling him to stay because there's a world war on the brink. But Jaffrey tells them that he's going to go back home because if he doesn't go now, he may never get back, and he wanted to die where he had lived. He's there for another three years before his family takes a furlough to Manila in the Philippines, And they make it back one day before Japan bombs Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. And then the invasion of the Philippines occurred just 10 hours later. So they literally made it back to Indonesia just hours before um, they would have been trapped. All the missionaries there in Makassar knew that the invasion of Indonesia was soon to come. And there's a story that Darlene Rose tells in her autobiography Uh, She's actually where I heard about Robert Jaffrey from, and she tells this story. On a Wednesday, a Dutch policeman came to inform us that they had a ship lying at anchor on the south coast. They wanted to evacuate all foreigners and all Dutch women and children who wished to go. A truck would call for us on Friday, and we should be ready. As we gathered for prayer, Dr. Jaffrey said, I want to counsel you not to discuss this, this decision, not even husband and wife. Go to your knees and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Shall I go or shall I stay? This is extremely vital because then no matter what happens in the months or possibly years that lie ahead, you will know that you are exactly where God wants you to be. If he leads you to leave, you'll never feel that you were a coward and fled. If you are led to stay, no matter what happens, you can look up and say, Lord, you intended for me to be right here. And we earnestly sought guidance. When the truck arrived on Friday, there was not one person among us who felt led to leave. As Dr. Jaffrey said, God does not work in confusion, a wife against a husband or vice versa. In a matter that concerns both of you, this is but a confirmation to your hearts of his directive. The Japanese invaded in March. They immediately killed the team pilot and soon after the pilot's wife and infant child. They separated the men from the women. Jaffrey was able to stay with the women because they thought that all of his colognes, which he loved to pack, were actually medicines and that he'd be dead soon anyway. So he was able to stay with his family for a year and then moved to a camp in Molina for a few months before being moved to Perry Perry. Reverend W.E. Presswood, who was one of the missionaries that worked with Jaffrey and was also with him in Perry Perry, writes this. Shortly after our arrival there, dysentery broke out, and in the next three months, more than two-thirds of the 600 men took sick with the disease. Of this number, over 25 died. Food was short. Sanitary conditions were beyond description. In the midst of the dysentery epidemic, we had constant air raid alarms. American planes flew over and around the camp daily, bombing and machine gunning in the neighborhood. It was the rainy season, and the tropical downpour converted the small creek into a mighty raging torrent during the night. Our camp life up to this time had been characterized by periods of terrorism by the guards when men were beaten senseless for the least offense, revived by a pail of water thrown over them, and then beaten again. And then I want to pick up with another narrative uh, by a Mr. Wetzel, uh, who was also there with uh, Jaffrey. He says, On June 1945, the Allies were closing in on the northern islands of Indonesia, and the Japanese decided to move us inland. We were transported 30 to a truck from our coastal camp to the mountains, a 16-hour trip. The older men were moved a few days later. 
Our new camp was located in a ravine about a mile from the end of the road. It rained constantly, and the so-called trail was a muddy, slippery quagmire laden with stumps and rocks. The older men could never have walked in, so we constructed makeshift stretchers of bamboo and set out at night to fetch them. Because of the steepness, we tied the older men into the stretchers. Jaffrey and the others were taken to a hastily thrown up infirmary, a simple bamboo and thatched shack with an earthen floor. Blankets were non-existent. Fortunately, Colonel Warwood of the Salvation army had an overcoat that he sold to Jaffrey for $20, with payment to be made after the war. Except for the seniors, the entire camp was on starvation rations. Often there was no food at all for 24, sometimes 36 hours. The daily ration was one half cup of rice, no salt or sugar, vegetables infrequently, and almost never any meat. Jaffrey needed salt and sugar, but none was to be had. A few men slipped out of the camp one night to try to find them at a nearby village. They returned empty-handed, and the guards, who performed a rare after-curfew roll call, beat them with clubs. I had dropped down to 98 pounds from a comfortable 150, but still had to work with the wood gang. I got dysentery again and was put in the infirmary about four beds from Jaffrey. Day by day, he grew weaker. The male nurse was instructed to call Presswood and me if he detected that Jaffrey was slipping away. Jaffrey went to be with the Lord in the middle of the night on July 29, 1945, just a few weeks before the war's end. The nurse failed to call me until early in the morning. Presswood then came and both of us wept at the bedside of one of God's choice servants. Presswood conducted the funeral service at 4 p.m. that cold and blustery day. A united Protestant and Catholic choir sang, Nearer my God to thee, in three-part harmony arranged by a priest. In his last prayer letter, written in 1942 upon his return to Makassar from the Philippines, Jaffrey had written, The promise is when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. He is with us not only before and after the danger, but when we pass through it. His promise is very real to our hearts. I mentioned earlier on in the episode how even though he butted heads with different people in the organization, especially the board, the people who served with him and were on his team loved him immensely. I wanted to share this snippet from the same man who gave us those last moments of Jaffrey, uh, Mr. Wetzel. He says, One of the greatest blessings of my life was the privilege I had of being interned with Dr. Jaffrey on the island of Sulawesi. If you enjoyed hearing about the life of Robert Jaffrey and you want to hear some more, I will link some resources for you in the description of this episode, including Tozer's biography and Darlene Rose's autobiography. As always, thank you for listening to Martyrs and Missionaries. I'm Elise.